where to start when talking about Don Quixote. It's only the greatest book of all time. Before us lie countless monsters, giants, ghosts, wizards, pirates and criminals, priests and saints, lovers both lost and reunited, battles and jousts, mysteries to solve, adventures to undertake, kingdoms to conquer, empires to rule, and most especially, story after story after story after story, and then still more stories within more stories which contain even more stories, and much more. I've heard it said that Don Quixote is the textual equivalent of all of Shakespeare's tragedies, so to study it can take a lifetime. For now, we must begin in the beginning, by beginning, as Galdós once wrote at the beginning of a novel whose title I won't remember. Let's contemplate the first chapter. Here we find the novel's exposition, the fundamentals we'll need to continue with the narrative. First we might ask, who is Don Quixote? We learn very quickly from the narrator that he is a poor gentleman in a small village of La Mancha. And if we recall the famous prologue, we know that this village is in the district of Campo de Montiel, but that does not help much as a geographical reference. So let's just say that he lives on the Meseta, the central plateau of Spain, just southeast of Toledo. What kind of life does this Hidalgo, this member of the low nobility of Castile, lead? Austere. Three quarters of his income goes to feed his household. He normally eats beef instead of lamb since the latter would be too expensive. And on Saturdays he eats a mysterious but symbolic dish called battles and defeats. Philologists believe this was a form of bacon and eggs. His clothing is completely outmoded. With whom does Don Quixote live? A housekeeper, a niece, and a stable boy. A curious range of ages and sexes chosen by Cervantes as company for a crazy old man. Where's the rest of his family? His wife, perhaps. It seems that he has none. What is our gentleman like? He's around 50, has a sturdy build, but his complexion is dry, his face gaunt. He is described as an early riser and an avid hunter. He seems energetic, but according to the literature of the time, his appearance connotes that his temperament is choleric and melancholic at the same time. As for his surname, we note that the narrator already begins to confuse us, alluding to other authors who have different opinions on the matter. Quixada, Quixada, maybe even Quixana. What problems motivate our hero? He is obsessed with the books of chivalry, which are affecting not only his mental state, but also his lifestyle. For starters, he has abandoned hunting, but he has graver problems, especially regarding the administration of his estate. In fact, he is now selling off parcels of land in order to buy the fantasy literature that obsesses him. Not only is he attracted to its content, but also its narrative style. Here we glimpse the humorous irony of Cervantes when he quotes passages that he has invented to characterize the style of literature that delights our crazy knight. The reason of unreason which has overtaken my reason. But wait, be careful. Here we confront something more than a simple parody of the narrative voice of the romances of chivalry. Rather, the phrase refers to one of the main themes of the very novel we are now reading, because the reason of unreason alludes to the logic of madness, which is to suggest that the insanity of our protagonist might exhibit moments of lucidity. Given Don Quixote's difficult economic situation, which only worsens due to his obsession with reading, the subsequent reference to Aristotle is an ironic twist. This classical philosopher was the main inspiration for the scholarship at the University of Salamanca, Spain's oldest academic institution, which had great importance in Cervantes' day. Moreover, Salamanca's classical ideal, Aristotle, was associated with the origins of the study of economics. And Aristotle begins his analysis of economics precisely in terms of a nobleman's administration of his estate. In other words, for Aristotle, there's a parallel between the proper management of expenditures and income at the level of a household and the proper functioning of the economy in general. The narrator tells us that Don Quixote has gone mad trying to decipher the intricate phrasings of the chivalric novels, which seemed like pearls to him, but which not even Aristotle himself would have been able to understand if he had been resurrected for that purpose alone. In other words, Don Quixote is confused about the basic value of things, and to the extent that he cherishes chivalric romances above everything else, he is now beyond the reach of the logic of the greatest philosopher of all time. Then the narrator delves deeper into Don Quixote's readings. Our Hidalgo has doubts about Don Belianis, a chivalric hero, because he would have been unusually scarred according to the number of wounds he receives during his adventures. 
Don Quixote's humorous skepticism manifests Cervantes' famous realism while indicating the deeply implausible nature of the romances of chivalry. Cervantes even tells us that Don Quixote had doubts about the capabilities of the doctors who must have attended Don Belianis. The famously reflexive, self-conscious nature of Cervantes' narrative appears again and again in those moments when he focuses on the act of writing. Don Quixote is a book that addresses in detail all aspects of writing. Here the narrator indicates that Don Quixote was pleased that the book of Don Belianis ended with the promise of more adventures and also that the Hidalgo wanted to write the sequel himself, but never did because of his psychological problems. Notice how complicated this really is. Not only did other authors like Avellaneda continue Cervantes' text, but our narrator has already confessed to us in the prologue that he had great difficulty finishing his own book. Now let's contemplate the heroes that Don Quixote takes from his readings. At this point, we also encounter two other important characters in our novel, the priest and the barber. Keeping in mind the protagonist's mental illness and his concerns for the scarified Belianis, we should notice something symbolic in the professions of his two friends. Around 1600, a priest, cura in Spanish, was occupied with curing the soul, and a barber did the same for the body, offering bloodlettings, for example. In the discussion between Don Quixote and his friends, we find a series of chivalric and epic heroes from novels to which Cervantes and his characters will refer throughout the text. Palmerin of England, Amadis of Gaul, the Knight of Phoebus. Amadis is the most representative hero of the chivalric romances, and Don Quixote will imitate him regularly during his adventures. For this reason, it is curious that the barber refers to Galaor, the brother of Amadis, emphasizing his superior manhood. For the barber, Amadis is too soft and weepy. We do well to remember this idea of Amadis as a great warrior distinguished from the others by his emotions. 